Whatever it is, lean in, pull up a seat, and know that this is a place for you to find purpose, a place for you to find community, to find a family. This is a place for you to belong. Welcome to church. Hey Amen. Go ahead and welcome your neighbor right now. Turn to someone and say, I'm so glad that you came today. Go ahead, do it. Welcome them. Maybe you already did. We are so glad that you're here today. Great to see you. I'm Pastor Mark. I'm one of the pastors here and get the privilege most Sundays to share the Word of God with you. And I just want to give a big JC Naz welcome to every single person who's come today. Um, I want all of you who are here in this physical location, I want you to do me a favor right now and lift up your voices. Very, very excited to welcome our Clay Center Church family. They're worshiping here right now. They're going to be hearing the same message that you're hearing right now. And God's doing great things all over the place, not just here in this time, this setting. Um, we, had a, we, have a, we have an early service, 8.30 service, and God did some amazing things there. And uh, we have a, a family that goes down to Dwight on Sunday mornings, and they're trying to make inroads there, trying to plant some seeds of God's love there. We got our Hispanic able to welcome some new guests there this morning. So anyway, just, we just celebrate all that God's doing. And we want to welcome you to this Back to Church today. Um, Maybe you're here because you were invited by a trusted friend and you were eager to accept that invitation. We're glad that you did. Maybe you were bribed with lunch. That's all right. Take them up on it. Make them, make them come through on that offer to lunch. Or, or maybe you just said yes and you were here today just to get your friend to hush up, you know. You're like, they're blowing up your phone. They're putting door hangers on your door. We invited thousands of people uh, this last uh, few weeks and uh, we're, we're so glad that you're here. Again, we have been praying and we've been anticipating for literally months now this Sunday, and we believe with all our heart that God is here, and God has a message for you. It's going to be relevant to your life. It's, it's going to bring many, we believe, as it already did in the first service, bring many to a point of decision that's not only going to impact their life here and now, but, but really impact where people spend all eternity. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to just talk to you from one verse. As I joke with our church family often, don't equate that with a short message, okay? Uh, one verse, but don't get confused. The message may be a little bit longer than you would think it would be with one verse. There's a lot packed into here. But I just want to talk to you from one single verse, and, and many have described this very verse that we're going to be studying and going deep in today as the greatest Bible verse ever. That's saying a lot because there's a lot of great verses, but they say that this is the greatest Bible verse ever because it contains in just one verse, in, in just um, 25 words actually, the greatest news ever. The greatest news ever. And here's the deal this morning. It could be good news for you. And the verse I'm talking about, people have said this is actually the entire Bible in one verse. Isn't that amazing? And so the verse I'm talking about, of course, is John 3.16. John 3.16. Um, it's so popular, in fact, is the reference or the, the message really of John 3.16, the truth it contains, that you can see it, you can see it wi widely in popular culture, contemporary culture all around us. Um, for example, maybe you've seen this guy at a football game, you know, the John 3.16 guy, you know, he, he always got the sign, and maybe you've seen that and wonder what it was all about, or maybe at a baseball game, uh, you got to admire this guy's uh, investment in his position. I wonder how much he paid for these seats to uh, have the John 3.16 sign, but he's there. And, and then I almost hesitate to mention this one so close to lunch, because I don't want to cause a stampede, but anybody recognize that cup? How many of you have been to In-N-Out Burger ever? I never have. Hands over here. What about you? Uh, I mentioned this to Pastor Linda, and she's like, oh, I love that place. She got very excited about it. But they are uh, a fast food chain, many of you know, primarily out west, and, and uh, they are Christian-owned, and so they are... Help with my mic. There he goes. And uh, they um, are so proud to put that John 3.16 reference on their cup. But if I was have to say, if I was have to name one person who is most responsible, perhaps, for driving the message of John 3.16 and, and bringing about a greater awareness of it in our culture, this man's name would have to be in the top five. It would have to be at the top of the list. However many you know that guy right there? Yeah, we got the verse on there too, but that's what he put. He put that under his eye, not just put eye black, but he inscribed the verse. And, and so when he played for the Florida Gators, you know, Tim Tebow, sophomore year, he won the Heisman Trophy, won many, many awards and recognitions. He went on to play for the Denver Broncos and on other teams as well. And, and it was when he was leading the Denver Broncos to a, a win, a victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers. You remember an overtime victory at that for quite a game. 
in the first round of the playoffs, he, he not only put the verse, but he put it under his eyes. He inscribed it in his eye black. And that caught so many people's attention, including the NFL, which they later banned it. Boo, right? They banned it. But anyway, we'll stay away from that. But, but it caught so many people's attention that in the course of that game and in the wake of that game, people, nine, listen to this, 94 million people, million people Googled John 3.16. They Googled it. They, it, it. It was reported that it was the number one trending search topic on Facebook and, and Twitter and all those things. And um, Google reported that after the event, John 3.16 skyrocketed to the top. And it stayed there actually several days as the number one trending search topic. Amazing. 94 million people got on their computer, got on their smartphone and said, what is John 3.16? Or just typed in John 3.16 so they could learn more about it. It kind of makes you wonder. I mean, I find that fascinating, actually. But it makes you wonder if people who did that actually know what they're searching for. It kind of makes you wonder if there's a whole lot of people in this world. We know at least 94 million, maybe some of you here today, You've heard bits and pieces of John 3.16. You may recall vaguely some words out of it. You may know it's in the Bible. Some of you even have it memorized. But I wonder, do a lot of people really understand what it contains and how incredibly it can impact their life and alter even their eternal destiny if they were to respond to it? And so let's lift our voices together this morning. Let's say this all together. Everyone all across the sanctuary, everybody watching online right now, we have a wonderful team back there welcoming and responding and praying for those who may be joining us and worshiping with us right now online if they request it. We're so glad you're with us. And I want you to just wherever you're at to um, lift your voices. Isn't it great that wherever you are this morning, God knows where you are, and he is very much desiring to speak a word powerful word into your life. So let's, let's put it on the screen. Let's say this all together. Ready? Three, two, one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that is good news. That is good news. But I want to tell you this morning, it can be good news for you personally. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to make this very simple on everybody. We're just going to go through this one phrase at a time, one powerful part at a time. And, and some, again, have referred to this as the entire Bible in one verse. I mean, if you, if you didn't have any rest of the scriptures, I'm so thankful we have this wonderful written record. I hope you're making use of it. I hope you're spending time in it, reading and getting to know God better and understanding the kind of relationship he wants with you and understanding how he strengthens you to walk in his purposes for your life. But if you didn't have any of this, if you just had this one verse, I'm telling you, this would be enough. This would be enough to help you know who God is and how much he loves you and the incredible length he went to to um, give you the greatest gift that's ever been given. And so let's just start right here. Let's just start where the verse starts, okay? For God. For God. I'm so amazed at the way this verse starts. For God. Are you aware this morning? Do you live with a daily uh, awareness that there is a real God who really exists? There is a God who is living and he's active and he's present right now with us. He's involved in your everyday life, my everyday life. Do you realize that every single day, every breath you take right now, you're breathing air that he created in and out of the lungs that he created do you realize that every beat of your heart is a reminder of this fact? In fact, the entire known universe is pointing to this reality, the existence of the one true God, the living God that John 3.16 talks about. Billions of stars, billions of galaxies, trillions and trillions of stars, uh, um, just all this, the solar systems, the planets, just unimaginable things, things we haven't even discovered yet. One astronomer by the name of Dr. Pete Edwards in trying to answer the question, how big is the universe? You ever wonder about that? You ever look up and you ever in the, at the ocean and just like, my goodness, how big is this place? How big is this universe? Well, in trying to answer that, he responds this way. Quote, you will never, ever get your head around how big the universe is. You expect it to be a little more scientific than that, right? But I mean, that's, I love his response. You will never, ever get your head around how big the universe is. He goes on, don't even go there because it's vastly enormous. There is no way that our human minds can grasp the immensity of the universe. This is a guy who went to school for this probably for a long time. This is a guy who studies this for a living. 
And he says, you know what? Don't even try to answer that question. Just stand there with your mouth open and stand in awe of the one who created it all. And yet we know behind it all, there is a God who spoke and the worlds were formed. I really like this quote by author and pastor Max Licato. He's become pretty popular over the years in his writings. And he, he says this, the number one missionary in the universe is the universe. And I never thought about it quite like that, but it's absolutely right on, I believe. What he's saying is that everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, every single day, the sky, you look at the stars, you look at the sun, the, 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 the trees blowing in the wind, you feel the warmth of the sun on your face, you see flowers and trees, and you, we experience the change of the seasons, we experience the miracle of birth, and everywhere, all around us, every single day, everything about this life is shouting to us, there is a God. There is a God, amen? Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. One of our pastors on staff this week sent us a, a devotional, and she's been sending them really every day since then. They were so good, and you know, I just said, keep them coming. It was written by a man named Francis Chan, and he was talking about all this, the immensity and the, the miracle of our, of our world and our universe and the God behind it all, and this is what he said. He said, our sun, do you realize our sun is 93 million miles away, but you cannot stare at it. You can't. And, and that's actually a very small star compared to the billions and billions of stars out there. It's actually quite tiny, our sun. You ever wonder how close you could get to the sun? You're like, no, that's crazy. Well, I, I actually did, and I Googled it. I looked it up. Do you believe there's actually information on how close you can get to the sun? I mean, why? What are you going to do? Are you going to try it one day? I don't think, I don't think anybody's going to. But I was interested, so I looked it up, and this is what I found, that you could actually get surprisingly close, but you could only get within about 1.3 million miles before you instantly combusted and burned up. We don't have a product on the planet to protect us against that kind of heat and the size of our sun. But actually, experts say you would never even get that close because of the gushing, constant flow of radiation coming out of our sun, they say actually when you hit the 46 million mile mark, about halfway actually, think about it like a football field, about the 50 yard line, you would cook from the inside out because of the exposure to the radiation. You would never make it. And what I'm trying to tell you with all this is, is John 3.16 is pointing us to the God who is the source of every single bit of it. And more amazingly, this is the God who's making himself known to you this very morning making himself known to you through this verse, for God, for God. The amazing thing about it is this God wants to know you, and he makes it possible for you to know him. I mean, really, really know him. You see, I think many people, maybe even some here this morning, have this vague, persistent awareness in them that there's somebody beyond themselves. There's somebody bigger than me outside of me, and, and there absolutely is. This someone is God. I love where John 3.16 starts, for God. But amazing as that is, that's, that's not all there is. Even more amazing than that there is a God who did all that he did, even more amazing is how he responds to us and the length he went to to express himself to us. It goes on, look at this with me, for God so loved. Go ahead and underline that, for God so loved. Now, now here's the danger. As incredible as that is, there's a danger in that, especially among those of us We've been around the church scene for a while, and you've heard this so many times, and maybe you grew up in the church, you grew up in the faith, and, and, and the temptation, the dangerous temptation is to say, well, yeah, of course God loves me. I mean, of course he loves. I mean, he loves everybody, right? He's God. He kind of has to love everybody, and, and the dangerous notion is that we would just see this as the most natural thing in the world, that a God like him would love someone like us, but it's, it's amazing. Do you... You understand who God is? Do you understand how indescribable He is? The, the Bible says that He is holy. He is holy. It describes those in His presence in heaven. That it says they never stop saying day and night. They never stop singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Bible says that He dwells in unapproachable light. The Bible in Isaiah 6-2 paints a picture of these majestic winged angels and they cover themselves in his presence because of the indescribable splendor and glory of his majesty. 
The Bible tells you and I that no one has ever seen God and lived, and yet this God, this very God, listen to me, he loves you. Yes, he does. He loves you. And and even in our sin, even in our rebellion, even in our human weaknesses and failings of the past, for God so loved, I'm telling you, he loves you. In fact, so high and deep and wide and long is the love of Jesus Christ for you that that the Bible actually says in 1 John 5, 8, 4, 8, excuse me, it says, God is love. God is love. It's hard to understand, I know, because as humans, you have to admit, we have a pretty warped view of what love is. Amen, all agreed? We have a pretty twisted view sometimes. We we probably, we we tend to, most of us tend to think of it as, as, as an emotion, you know, something I, I feel if everything's going great and if everybody around me treats me nice and then, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an emotion. Sometimes it's so superficial and just often limited to the romantic, but I'm telling you, not with God. You know, we say we love everything. We say, I love Arby's. I say that a lot, very guilty of that. I'm feeling an Arby's crave coming on right now, I got to admit, Arby's sauce. I love these new clothes I got, we'll say. We, I love Patrick Mahomes. No, no, you don't. No, you don't love him. You respect him. You admire his abilities, but you don't love him, okay? And so we got this word all kind of mixed up. And yet, when it says that God is love and God loves you, it's in another category all its own. You may want to jot this down. This is is what it means right here. God's love is this right here. It's unconditional, unceasing, selfless action towards you. Unconditional, unceasing, selfless action. It's a decision God makes regardless of how you respond to him or what you do. It has nothing to do with your behavior at all. You understand? He gains nothing from this. He benefits nothing from this. God needs nothing from us, and yet he chooses He makes a conscious choice to love you and I with unceasing, unconditional, selfless action. And so this morning, you've found your way somehow, some, in some way. You found yourself into this worship gathering, and we're so glad that you're here. But maybe because of your past, and maybe because of your experiences in different parts of your life with different people, you have a hard time grasping the idea of God's love for you. But please hear this this morning. Hear this with more than just your ears. Somehow allow it to travel the 18 inches down from your head and to your heart and really get deep down inside of you. Listen to me, no matter how others have failed you, no matter how short others have fallen in loving you, you may have come here and you may have been rejected at some point. You may feel so lonely. You may feel ignored and left out. Even deeper than that, you may feel used and abused. But listen to me this morning. This is the one and only unchanging truth in the entire universe. God loves you. God loves you, and please hear this, because I'm sure of it right now. There are people sitting here right now that when you hear that, you want so desperately to believe it and receive it, but, but for whatever reason, there's a barrier, and you're thinking, oh, I, I believe he loves, but, but other people. This is for other people you're thinking right now. This is for people who are, that act better than me and have done better, and they haven't messed up as much as me, and they haven't, they're more lovable than me, but I'm telling you, that's a lie. That's a lie. The truth is God loves you. And again, you didn't earn it. and You didn't deserve it. Neither did I. But yet still, God loves you. Again, not in some gushy, mushy, cheap, superficial way. But I'm telling you, in the deepest, most purest, strongest, life-giving way possible, more than you could imagine. And then notice this. Notice the scope of God's love. God loves. That's wonderful. But notice the scope of his love. For God so loved the world the, the world. Have you noticed what's going on in our world lately? Have you noticed how dark it is and twisted and broken and sinful? Do, do you ever look around and you, do you ever just find yourself wondering, man, what is holding back? It, it feels like the dam that is holding back just this all-out outburst of evil and anarchy is just going to break open any time. You're just like, man, what is holding all that back? You can just bust open, you hear reports of awful things. Things that make us want to distract ourselves with busyness and TV. I, 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 
when I think of things like um, when I think of things like human trafficking, I can't even get my mind around that. How there are actually people in this world right now, it's happening right now, people taking children, sometimes I've read as young as two years old, and they're selling them to awful people and using them and abusing them, and when they're done with them, they just throw them out like garbage. And I'm so thankful we got people here in this church family who are deeply passionate about stopping that and asking God to intervene and shine his light in that incredible darkness. But you think about things like that or maybe something else, and then you read this verse and you say, for God so loved the world? Yeah, this world. Amazingly enough, what we're talking about today that's available to each one of us is available to each one of those people too. So, so, so unbelievably, undescribably wide is the scope of God's love. He, he doesn't just love the good people. He doesn't just love a select few. God's love isn't just limited to those who seem to have it all together on the outside or live better than most or find their way into a church on a Sunday morning. God's scope of God's love is indescribable. We know from the scriptures that God is incredibly compassionate and kind and patient and generous, even with the most stubborn sinners. In Ezekiel 18, 23, God himself says this, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? says the Sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways? That's what we call repentance. They turn away from their sin and live, he says. That's really what I want. That's what I want from every single person in the universe. So listen to this again. Listen carefully. This is for you. This describes every single person in the universe. For God so loved the world. And right now, in this moment, believe it or not, it's true. God sees you He knows you. He has a future and a hope for you. You matter to him. You matter to him. And God's love is greater than you say, oh, no, I've fallen too far. I've been gone too long. I've done terrible things. Listen, God's love is greater than it all. And he wants to remind you, just like he reminded the people in Jeremiah's day who were having a hard time believing it too. He wants to tell you, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31.3. You say, well, that, that sounds wonderful, Pastor Mark. That, that sounds great, but I, excuse me, but I think I'm going to need some proof. All right, fair enough. Absolutely. That's what's in the next part of this verse. It's right here in God's Word. May God open your eyes to it this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. A lot of people talk about it. A lot of people, oh, I love you. And then they do something that seems to contradict that love, but not God. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I'm telling you, hands down, without a doubt, indisputable, the greatest act of sacrificial love in human history. End of story. It just everyone, this includes everyone, regardless of any kind of commitment of faith, regardless of if their belief, listen, God's love extends to them. And some people... Some people believe, you know, in just this universalism. You know, l- listen to this. If God was just love, without this act of giving his son, if he was just love, then he would say, you know what? Everybody gets in. Doesn't matter what you believe or how you believe or if you believe. Doesn't matter if you ever acknowledge me a second in your life. Doesn't matter how wicked you are or how you persist in your rebellion. Everybody gets into heaven. You know what? Some people believe that. I mentioned it. Some people believe it. It's called universalism. Very dangerous, dangerous doctrine. I, I, I'll be honest, I wish it was true. That would be great. We wouldn't have to worry about people's souls. We wouldn't have to worry about preaching a message like this because everybody would get in. But I'm telling you, out of love, that is a false and dangerous doctrine. There's nothing, I mean nothing in all the pages of the Scripture. Believe, I've read it. Nothing in all the pages to support that view. Instead, yes, God is love, but God also teaches us that He is holy and he's righteous and so pure and holy and almighty. He, he cannot tolerate sin in his presence. He cannot look upon it. He cannot allow it to be in his presence. And then the Bible goes on to say that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, so think about this. Connect with me. you got a holy God who cannot tolerate sin. He can't even look upon it. He, if he did, he wouldn't be God. He's holy. And we've all got a sin problem. We, we've all got sin in our lives if we've not asked Jesus to come and help us. Would you agree that presents quite a dilemma? Because if I want to be with God forever in heaven someday, if that's where I want to end up, 
that's where I want to be, then, then, but, but I can't because I've got this sin problem. Well, what are we going to do? Well, the Bible answers it, but listen, it's a problem. Not just in the community, not just in Hollywood, not just in politics. It's a, it's a problem in every human heart, your heart, my heart, again, if we've not come to know Jesus. And it's a problem that is so serious, it separates us from God and the life that's in God. And even more than that, it's a problem because it separates us not just from God in this world, but if we don't respond to his love and put our faith in him, it separates us forever in the life to come. I want to I paint a picture for you. Get, I like to think visually. Maybe this will help some of you get your mind around this. Imagine with me a, a door over here, a, a, a beautiful white, pure white wooden door, and it leads to the most beautiful white room you could ever imagine. I mean, beautiful, pure, pristine white walls, plush, perfectly white carpet, white furniture, everything. It's the most beautiful, most peaceful thing you've ever seen, and you want to go in so badly, but as you approach the door, you realize you've got oil and tar all over your hands, and it's dripping down your elbows, and you look at your shoes, and you've got sludge and mud and grease and everything on your shoes, and You ask the one at the door, can I come in? They say, no, no, no. We can't let you come in because of your condition. you you got a problem. Now, here's how most of us approach this. We want to go in the room so badly. We want to to gain interest into there. It's awesome. But we can't go in like this. And so most of us say, okay, I, I know i got a problem. I'll fix it. Tell me what I need to do. i got to be able to do something. I'll clean it up. we we got that mentality, right? I got a problem, I'll fix the problem. But do you realize that's the kind of self-sufficient pride that keeps people alienated from God in the first place? If that could solve the problem, then we wouldn't need God. If, that, if we could fix our own problem, our sin, then listen, we, this verse would be irrelevant because God would have never had to have sent his son if you could have fixed it yourself, but we cannot. So imagine with me again, you're standing at that door and you realize I got to get in there and I got to fix this problem. So you don't have anything to really work with, but you find in your pocket an old nasty used up tissue. This is only for prop value only. This is not used. Just, just relax, okay? So you reach into your pocket and instantly you spread tar and oil all over your pocket. But you're, you're determined you're going to get in that room. So you pull out your little tissue and you start wiping and you start scrubbing and you start vigorously. I mean, after an hour, you're still going at it, and you, you begin to scrub more fervently, and you're, you're more determined than ever, but after about an hour, your tissue is in shreds. It's just disintegrated into nothing. And as you're standing there looking at yourself, you, you didn't fix the problem. You actually made it worse. This wave of hopelessness begins to sweep over you because you realize, I can't fix this. I can't make this better. I'm not, I'm not getting in there by myself. Now, if you can grasp that for a moment, if you can get that kind of sense of hopelessness, you're beginning to understand a little bit of the absolute impossibility and hopelessness of trying to fix your own sin and overcome your own sin. How many of you would agree with me? Our sin is a greater problem than just oil and tar on our hands. And there's so much more at stake than getting some silly imaginary white room. What we're talking about today carries with it eternal life and death consequences, eternal life and death. Now, if the message ended right there, if we was to dismiss everybody right now, you would probably leave here saying, hmm, I don't think John 3.16 is very good news. <laughs> now that, that is bad news. That's dark news. But listen to the rest of it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You see, God knew better than anybody that you could not solve your sin problem on your own. And so what he did is he stepped into time and into history to do for you and I what we could never do for ourselves. Let me try to make this real for you again in a different way. I, I just want to drive this so deep into your hearts this morning. So, Tarek, where are you, buddy? And, and my son, come here, buddy. Come here, Gabe. Come here. You can come up here. Yeah, no? Uh-oh. He's, the illustration's going off the rails. Can you come here? I want to help you. Yeah. No? Okay. All right. We'll bring him up here. Tarek, come on up. Yeah. So, Tarek is a good friend. We love him. Such a vital part of the mission here, but Tarek is, a, is going to be our sinner today. He's a, he's a sinner, full of his life, and, he, and his behavior, and his daily actions prove that he's a sinner by nature. He does things that he's mean to his pastor, 
and he, he exhibits a sinful, he's full of sin. And because of his sin, he deserved God's, he deserved God's punishment. There's got to be consequences. The Bible actually says the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve for our sin against the holy God. It, it's a major problem, and it, and it creates a chasm between him and God that he can't overcome on his own. Let me introduce you to somebody else if he'll come. He, he said earlier, he said earlier he would love to help me preach. Maybe we'll get him. Oh, we won't. Okay, well, bring him up here anyway. Bring him up here anyway. I have, my, I have to have my wife help. Yay, everybody forgave. He ran into me this morning. He said, I'm going to help you preach. I'm going to help you preach. But a little overwhelming, as you can imagine. So, so this is my son. We have three daughters as, as well, but this is, in fact, our only son. Our only son. So you want to know what God did? God looks at us as sinners. And although we deserve punishment and also we deserve his wrath and death, this is what God chose to do. This is the length he went to to express his love for you and to rescue you from a problem you could never escape from. He chose to take our sin off of us and all the punishment and everything that goes with it, and he chose to put it on his son, his only son. And all the punishment and all the pain and all the torture and the cross, and the scourging, and the unbelievable manner in which Jesus died. He put that all on his son. Thank you. You can, you can be, be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Now, let, who does that? Who does that? Why does the punishment not go to the one who has sinned and did the wrong deeds? Why does it go to the sinless one? Who, who would ever think of doing that? Well, we know, for God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son. Now, is this not the greatest Bible verse ever? Is this not the greatest news you've ever heard? Come on, tell me this morning. Listen, if it's not, I'm not doing a very good job communicating. I'm not doing a good job at all. Now, now this part is absolutely vital. Listen, stay tuned in. This is the most important part of the message right here. Because up until this point, as good as it may be for you to hear this, up until this point, without this next part, this is just information. Without this next part, you may grieve everything so far. You may say, you know what? I believe there is a God. I believe he loves me. I, I believe all this stuff. But without this next part, it has zero impact on your life and where you will spend eternity. So look at this next part with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Here it is. That whoever, whoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. You see, this is good news. It's the greatest news ever, but in order for it to be good news for you, there has to be a response. You know, thinking about it won't do anything. Knowing about it, being familiar with all this, being able to recite the verse frontwards and backwards and all ways, it, it won't matter. Thinking about what God has done for you, believing that he made it possible for you to be forgiven of your sins will do zero for you this morning unless you... Well, it requires a personal response. Belief. Belief. Now, i, I got to quickly say, this word believe is so misunderstood. It's so vital. We understand this. Believe in him. Well, let, me, let, me, let me get the point this way. How many of you, show of hands, everybody participate. How many of you believe you should exercise regularly, more often? Okay, keep them up, keep them up. How many of you believe, we're going to get every hand up here. How many believe you should eat healthier, less potato chips, more salad? Keep your hand up. Don't get tired. How many believe you should floss? Yes. Now, now put your hands down if you're not doing those things as often as you know you should. Put your hands down. Anybody's hands still up? Almost every hand went down. We got a few shining stars out there. Yeah, my brother-in-law's a dentist, and he asked me, Mark, have you been flossing? And my head hits the floor. We know we should. We believe it's good. You believe you should exercise. You believe you should eat healthier than you probably do. You should believe you should floss more. We, li listen, tragically, many, many people in our world respond to John 3.16 in the same way. You understand what I'm saying? They believe there's a God. They believe that he loves people, even the entire world, even, even the most sinful people. They, they believe that there, that there is a man named Jesus who gave his life. That he actually died on the cross. They believe all this, but, but they're not believing in a way that affects their everyday life. It has zero impact for many of them on their everyday, ordinary life. And I just, I'm just telling you, because I love you, even if I've never met you, I love you, that kind of belief, that kind of approach to this will not get you to heaven. 
He will not get you to heaven. The kind of be- you can have, though, the kind of a belief that leads you to an experience of forgiveness of sins. You can have the kind of belief, though, that leads you to an experience of eternal life. You, you can have this. But it's the kind of belief that says, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are, and I believe you've done everything that needs to be done for me. It's the kind of belief that says, I believe you died on the cross for me, that you rose from the dead for me, which proves forever you are God. It's the kind of deep belief that brings this unshakable joy and peace over your life because you know that you know that you know that you've been forgiven of your sins because you have personally, intentionally embraced Jesus Christ as your Savior. So I just want to simply ask you this morning, listen, listen to this verse again one, one more time, one more time. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes should not perish. There's not a person on this planet God wants to perish, but have eternal life. Isn't that amazing? You can have eternal life. You can have it. And, and this morning you can leave here knowing Knowing that you have it, you can know that. It's not arrogant to say, I have it. First John 5.12 says this right here. It says, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So here's what that means for every single one of us and everybody watching online and elsewhere right now. This means there's two groups of people within the sound of my voice. Those who have the Son, meaning they've turned from their old life and turned from their sins and they've put their whole faith and trust in Jesus as their Savior, and they have life, then there's another group of people who do not have the Son, meaning they've not yet crossed the line of faith and trusted Him, and as a result, they do not have life. And if that path is continued on, they will spend forever separated from Him in a place called hell. But the good news this morning is that does not have to be the case for any person here today. That that does not have to continue one day longer. Listen, you can have eternal life. I'm telling you, a hundred years from now, nothing else will matter but this. And you can have eternal life, not by trying harder, not by trying to be a better person, not by coming to church more, not by just waiting till the very end and hoping somehow, some way, it will all work out. Not, not in any of those ways, but you can have it this morning, this gift of forgiveness and eternal life by, by simply saying, yes, Lord. I need you, God. I can't do it without you, God. It's hopeless without you. So let me ask you this question, and then we're going to close. Praise team, you can come up. I'm going to ask some pastors and leaders to get ready. to Join me right up here in just a moment, please. You be ready. Go ahead and stand to your feet, please. And Just really hear this this morning. I'm going to ask you the most serious question that anybody could ever ask you. Here's the question. Are you saved? Are you saved? Meaning, have you intentionally made a conscious decision at some point in your life that you know of, you could mark it down, you may not know the date and the time, but you know it happened, that I turned from my sins and I turned to Jesus Christ and I embraced him as the only hope for my forgiveness and my salvation. And I'm living for him today, I'm following him today. That, that's what we mean by being saved, by being a follower of Jesus. If you say no, it's amazing when I ask people out in the community, Are you saved? You know that you know that if you were to die today, you'd spend forever in heaven with God. It's amazing how many people say, no, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. I I, I would hope so. I would like that to be the case, but I can't. So if that's you this morning,